doing a series uh, called Deeper. And it's been awesome, I think. And uh, and today is the last series of it. And, and I really believe it's a word in season for not only your life, but our church in general. And I believe that if you would open up your heart today, that God could really speak to you in your circumstance and where you are in your life. See, I want to talk about going deeper. But I, I want to bring some clarity to deeper. So Somebody say deeper. deeper. See, because sometimes I hear Christians say, I want to go deeper, and I feel like what they're thinking deeper is isn't necessarily what the deeper life in Christianity actually is. And I want to tell you some stories here. And I heard a story from a, a pastor one time. He was a, a avid fisherman, loved fishing. And he went down to Florida, was fishing with some buddies, and I believe it was Miami or something. And he's, he's coming in one day after fishing, you know, going in with the boat. They were about 100 feet from the marina. And he looks over, and there's this guy swimming. And he thought, that's weird that it's, you know, the sun's going down. It's really, there's been, they've seen sharks in the water. And he looks over, and there's a guy swimming. He thinks, that's weird. That doesn't seem right. So he tells his friend, they said, let's go check it out. They, they go over there, and sure enough, this guy was drowning. And so they, they reach over, and they yank him on. And what had happened is he was fishing by himself. He fell overboard somehow, and the wind just kept pushing his boat just out of reach. And he couldn't, couldn't get to it. And, and he said to him, if you didn't come, I, I, I was going down for the last time. I almost died. So they went out, got him on his boat, you know, said bye to him, and they said he just carried on fishing again, as fishermen do, I guess. So they carry on back into the marina. They were about 100 feet away. It wasn't a very long journey. They're trudging on in. As they get in, they get to the marina, which was with, within eyesight of all that had happened. And in the marina were a bunch of boats, beautiful you know, multi-million dollar yachts sitting there. You know, boats are meant to be out in the water, aren't they? But so many boats, they're just at the marina, rotting. Anyways, they pull up, and as they do, there's this one couple, they said, on, on one of the really nice yachts. Said dude is just like ripped and tan, you know, like me almost. Just like picture that, <laughs> but probably not quite as, as big. And uh, this just ripped beach guy and his, his girlfriend is, is standing there. And, and he said they pull up. They just rescued this dude from the water who was drowning. And then the guy and the girl look at him like this. And then he said, I don't know why. He just looks over and he just smacks his girlfriend right on the bottom. Isn't that ironic? Isn't that weird? I just rescued this guy who was drowning. And then here's a guy on a yacht. Smacking his girlfriend on the bottom. It's just such an ironic situation. And I think, I think what we think sometimes as Christians, when we want to go deeper, we go, I want to, we, we almost get a marina mentality. And we, we get in the marina and we get in the yacht club. And you could be in the yacht club and have a big yacht and never go out into the ocean. And you could know all the theory about yachts, couldn't you? You could know the wind and the waves and how they blow. But the interesting thing is, is, is the people who are on the dock with the boats weren't even out in the water. In 100 feet away, someone was drowning. And we need to understand as a church, we have got to be positioned that we're looking out and we need to go into the deep. See, deep isn't just knowing more. You know what's deep? is actually casting out into the deep where people are drowning. People are drowning right outside where we look. And we can be, if we're not careful, docked at the marina in our lives, building up our boat, building up our lives, building up, learning more, growing more. Learning is great. I love learning. But you don't learn at the expense of casting out into the deep. Does that make sense? Because I want to, before I even move on with more of the message, I want to change a mentality for some of you that says 
if I want to go deeper with God, the only way to go deeper is digging deeper into theology. Theology is wonderful. Theology is fantastic. And we must learn theology and doctrine and study the word of God as best as we can. But I've witnessed over some years, being a Christian now, is that people begin to say, I want to go deeper with God. And what they mean is, I want to dig deeper into theology. And and if they're not careful, what happens is they develop a marina mentality. And they start to just sit at the marina with their yachts, and they start digging deep into all the theory. It's like the yacht person who's digging. He knows every single definition and term there is to know about yachting and sailing. He knows all the density of the ocean and where he should go and how the wind blows in from this direction and that, the exact form and way and everything you're supposed to do it, yet they're never casting out into the deep to actually go rescue someone. But then what happens, you know what Proverbs says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. See, and and I'm not saying you don't learn theology. I'm not saying you don't dig in deeper. But I am saying you cannot do it at the expense of casting out because the deep is where people are drowning. That's what's happening in the deep. And so if you want to be a deep Christian, yeah, learn theology. Study as hard as you can, but cast out into the deep where the people are drowning. Please get this. Because I have seen Christians who have developed the marina mentality. They start digging in, and then they get puffed up with pride, and then they just start criticizing the other people who are going out into the deep, sitting back there on their yacht. Oh, look at that guy on his yacht. He doesn't know what he's doing. Look at that form. That form is terrible. He should know that when the wind comes this way, you go that way, and you put the sail this way and not that way. But I want to tell you something. When you're actually the one casting out into the deep, it gets a little messy sometimes. You get so frantic trying to rescue that your form might go. Maybe you don't remember the direction of the wind. But who are you going to be the one who casts out into the deep to rescue? Or are you going to be the one sitting on the sidelines who knows all the right answers and is judging all the other people who are going out into the deep? Oh, look at that guy. His swimming technique's terrible. It's just, he doesn't even know what he's doing. And I want, I want to make this clear because I have met so many Christians who have gotten this mentality. And their definition of going deep in God is digging deeper into theology, which is a good thing, if you are balanced in it. And then you puff up with pride. And then I have met so many Christians who have done this, and then they can't even read a book without criticizing. They can't watch a sermon without criticizing. And I want to tell you what, they're missing out on some gold because whenever I read a book, I, I realize that not everything I read is perfect. I realize the only thing that's perfect is the word of God. So any message or sermon or book that I read is going to have a little bit of error. But God uses everything. And if I pray, every time I pray, I say, God, whatever is true and of you, stick it to my heart and change me. Whatever isn't of you, let it fall on deaf ears. But some of you will get stunted in your Christian growth because you can't even listen to a message or read a book without criticizing that person who's casting out into the deep to rescue people. I don't want us to be that church. I do not want to be a critical spirited church who judges everybody else in their theology and what they're doing and what they're doing wrong. But I want to go out with people into the deep and our form might get messed up and the way we do it might get messed up sometimes, but we are the ones casting out to rescue the lost and the hurting people in our world. Amen. I love this quote from Theodore Roosevelt. Check this out. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself on a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place 
shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And my fear is that sometimes we can trade our ivory tower Christianity for rugged cross Christianity. The ivory tower, have you ever heard that? It's, it's a statement that says, oh, they're just up in their ivory tower. It stands for, it's become to stand for someone who's so up in their lofty tower that they're so disconnected from reality. See, I could go through all these theological words. I wrote some down. You got hypostatic union and incarnation. You impute exegesis, hermeneutics, isogesis, kinesis, amenalism, historic premillennialism, postmillennialism, all of these millennialisms and all these big words, and they're great to know, but you know who doesn't give a rip about those? The guy who's about to die drowning. He doesn't care. All he wants right now is someone to reach down and pick him up and put him in the boat. So learn the things, learn the words, learn the theology. I love that. That's great. But don't just sit there and puff yourself up with all this knowledge when 100 feet from shore someone is drowning and dying because that's what's hard, that's what's dirty, and that's what's messy. Do not trade our ivory tower. Let's trade our ivory tower Christianity for rugged cross Christianity. So where's that in the Bible? Let's go to Luke 19. I'm glad you asked. Luke 19. I couldn't find my little preaching Bible today, so I got my big old study Bible. Luke 19, 1 through 10. Let's read this. Are we all there? If you're there, say, I'm there, Justin. I'm there, Justin. I like that. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was the chief tax collector. Those were the bad dudes. Nobody liked tax collectors. They were like the worst of the worst in that day. He was a tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who, or see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short stature. Again, like me, a little bit short. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. Say, Oh, no, Jesus. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham, the son of a man. So listen to this. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Do you know who was mad about Jesus hanging out with the tax collectors? The Pharisees and the religious people. So what are you doing hanging out with those wrong people? What are you doing, Jesus? Jesus said, you're missing it. You got your laws. You got your rules. You, you, you know everything there is to know about the Bible. But I did not come just to increase your knowledge. I did not come just so you can know more about all the deep things of theology. I want you to. I want you to know me. I want you to learn. But here's why I came. To seek and to save that which was lost. And seeking and saving church happens in the deep. Seeking and saving happens in the deep. And it's messy and it's rugged and it's hard. You do not have to get your master's in theology to go rescue people. And I just want to free some of you up right now. We live in a culture that, that can make you fearful to go try to minister and go help people and go, go help rescue people because you don't have your master's degree in theology. I want to tell you. You don't need your master's degree to swim into the deep and go rescue someone. So some of you just need to hear that. Go. Go rescue people. And in the process of swimming, in the process of diving to the deep, you're going to get knowledge and strengthen in what you need on the journey. And where you fail, you'll get back up and learn how not to do it. Cast out, church. 
We will never be a church who's going to sit in our ivory tower and just gather together and let's just learn deep while the world around us is lost and dying. Yeah, we want to learn, but I want us to be a church on the move. I want us to be a rescue mission. I don't want us to be a yacht club. I want us to be a rescue mission who's casting out into the deep to rescue people. Amen? Now I can start my sermon. Yeah. See, but I wish, as I thought about this, I thought, I wish, though, it was just like casting out into the ocean to go rescue people. I wish it was that you just go, you know what, I'm going to go. I'm going to go into the deep. I'm going to go make a difference. I'm going to go rescue people. And you go out, and you get there, and you rescue them. But I want to tell you, I wanted that analogy for the yacht, but I want to tell you this. It's more like going into a battlefield than going out into the deep ocean. See, because when you swim out into the ocean, you don't really have anything against you. But when you go deeper into the battlefield, you have an enemy against you. And, and, and I want to tell someone today, and I want to encourage us today to press deeper in, to go cast that into the deep. But as we do that, we need to know what we're doing is going deeper into the enemy's territory. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going deeper. See, we are going deeper into the enemy's territory. And as I prepare this message, I really felt like this was a word for our church. Because what I felt like we did at the end of last year and the beginning of this year was we rallied together and we said, yes, we want to be a rescue church. Yes, we want to see revival. Yes, we want to see lives change. Yes, we want to give our all. We want to give everything. And we huddled together. And what we were saying is, yes, we're going to take on the enemy. We're going to dig deep in. We're going to go deep into the enemy, enemy's territory. And we're going to go conquer him. But then here's what I believe. I believe then the enemy rose back up against us because he is an enemy. The devil is real. And, and, and the enemy is real. And he seeks to destroy us. And I believe what happened and I believe what is happening with us individually and us as a church body, us as a family of risen life, we stepped up to go. And we began trudging into the enemy's territory. But then he began rising up against us. He began rising up to take us out, to stop us. And I believe today we need to realize that there is an enemy. He is trying to come against us. And if we are not aware of that, we will get taken out. And we will not be able to rescue because we got taken out by the enemy. See, look, let's look at 2 Corinthians 2.11. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says this. He's talking, then he says, he's talking about forgiveness and all this, and he says, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. When I read that, you know, he said it like, you know, we're not going to get outwitted, for we're not ignorant of his designs. And I thought to myself, sometimes I feel a little ignorant. Do you guys ever feel ignorant of his designs? Or is somebody in here like, no, I know. I know the way he's coming at me. I know what he's doing. See, I think so many times the enemy is coming against us, and we don't even realize it. But let me be clear here also. There's a balance. Okay, not everything bad that happens to you is the enemy. Okay, you wake up, you're discouraged, you're tired, you, you, you can't function in the morning, you're like, the enemy's coming against you. It's like, well, what time do you go to bed? Four o'clock in the morning. Well, why don't you go to bed? Let's, there's some, there's not everything is Satan. Not everything is demonic. Not everything is evil. You've heard that one story, haven't you? Satan's sitting there on some stairs just hands in his head, sobbing, crying. Jesus walks up past him and says, what's wrong, Satan? He goes, these people, they're blaming me for everything. See, there's a level of natural, there's a level of, of things just happen, but I want to tell you, I think where most of us err in this room, in our culture and day and age, is that we don't attribute enough to Satan and what, what's happening. The, the battle. 
See, the Bible says in Ephesians, and I want to dig into Ephesians later, in Ephesians 6, but it says we're not fighting against flesh and blood. See, when we rise up to go deeper, church, we have to understand the enemy is not just going to let us waltz in there and take our prisoners of war back. He's not just going to let us waltz in there and go rescue and take the kingdom of God forward just in skips and hops. Yay! We did it! That was easy. Staples. Boom. That was easy. If you know what I'm talking about. You have to understand, when we progress in towards the enemy's territory, when we go deeper into the enemy's camp, he will rise up against us. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians that we shouldn't be outwitted by him, for we're not ignorant of his designs. The Bible says he seeks around like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. And I want to tell you, he rises up to divide. He rises up to destroy. He rises up to make you in able to move forward. And as I thought about this sermon, I thought, I'd love to, to, to write down and give you guys all of the different strategies that Satan does. But, but as I thought about it more, I thought, you know what's more important is realizing what he's trying to do. So that whatever's coming against you, you can realize what he's trying to do. Because I want to tell you, as things happen over your life, you start moving forward with God. You start moving forward with a vision, with a dream to make a difference for God. The thing Satan wants to do the most is paralyze you from moving forward. He wants to paralyze you from moving forward. And he will use any means necessary. He will use bitterness. He will use offense. You think that, that as we rise up as risen life and we say, yeah, we want to take on cities and we want to see revival come to universities and we want to see amazing things happen. Do you think he's not going to rise up to bring offense to your heart against someone in the church or even us or somebody in the church? Of course he is. Because if he can divide what God's brought together, he's already beginning to win. And, and if you're not careful, see, we're like an army squadron. We're like together, and we said we're going to do this thing. But what's happening is some people, some of you and some people who are not here, you began getting bitterness and offense and this lust and this fleshly thing and this and that, and he's seeking to take you out from the squadron that he placed you in so that you can start wandering out on your own where there's no safety and security, where he can paralyze you from moving forward into all that God has created you to do. And this message is for you, but it's for our church body. And I want us so bad to rise up today and not be ignorant of the devil's schemes and to not be ignorant of his designs so that we can rise up and see the dreams that God's given this church come to fruition but it will not if we let him begin taking us out and we let bitterness and offense and, and, and addiction and all these things start taking place in our heart. Because I want to tell you something. You can never reach your best if you're letting those things in your life. I have witnessed Christians who have let offense in their heart and it has taken them out of the race. Because Jesus said, if you are not forgiving, that I forgave you. You need to forgive. Who are we to say, I'm not going to forgive you when Jesus forgave us? That's so hypocritical. And by the way, you're not fighting against flesh and blood. So when you're not forgiving someone else, you are giving in to Satan's schemes to take you out. You are not fighting against that person. You're fighting against the enemy. So why would you give him any room? He rises up against you in addictions and in lust, and he rises up against you in the flesh. Those things that, God, that the enemy is drawing you towards that you know you're not supposed to be doing, they're not helpful to you. You think those things, those sins, that sleeping with that person, that doing that thing, that watching that thing that you know you're not supposed to do, but you decide to do it anyways, you think that's going to benefit you? All you're doing is giving room to Satan and he seeks to kill and destroy you and your potential. If you carry down your path of your sin, it will destroy you. But the Bible says 
Jesus came to bring life. And life to the fullest. We all have potential in here that's like a seed. And when you have a seed, there's a great potential in it. Do you know what the potential of a seed is? The potential of a seed is a tree, right? But that's not actually true. The potential of a seed is actually a tree that actually grows up and has more seeds, that actually has more seed, that actually has more trees, and more seeds have more trees and more trees have more seeds and more seeds have more trees until one seed can make an entire forest. But if, God, if the enemy can take out your one seed, he will take out an entire forest that you could have impacted. He will take out an entire forest that we as a church could impact. I want to fight right now, church, because I want to tell you the enemy has been coming against us as a church, coming against you as a person. And I've seen it in many of your lives. You are battling to the death. And I want to tell you the enemy is fighting hard because he's trying to take your seed. He's trying to take our seed. Because if he can divide us, and if he can take our seed, he takes our potential. But God wants to do immeasurably more than we could ever dream or imagine. And we need to not be ignorant of the devil's schemes. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. And we need to rise up and say, no, I will stand my ground. I will do what it takes. I will serve faithfully. I will give faithfully. I will pray faithfully. I will be faithful, loyal, and consistent, just like I've been preaching. Not right now, but, you know, the other messages, if you haven't heard them. Because I so don't want the enemy to take your seed. And I want to tell you all those things that Satan tries to do over your life. All he's trying to do is take your seed of potential, drinking, what you're watching. I don't care if all your friends are sleeping with their boyfriend and girlfriend in college. That's not what the Bible says to do. And all it's trying to do is steal your potential. Don't give your potential away for some quick, easy sin that seems like it's fun at the time. And I want to tell you, if you turn, God can restore you. But I've seen too many people. Have you ever heard somebody wake up one day and say, you know, I think I want to be an alcoholic what I want to do with my life. Have you ever heard somebody say, you know what, I think when I get older, I'm going to cheat on my wife, and so I end up with a broken family. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Then how does it happen? If that was never anybody's intention, then how does it happen? I'll tell you how it happens, because one little thing leads to another little thing, and another little thing leads to another little thing, and before you know it, you're way farther in than you ever wanted to be. And that's what Satan wants to do. He lures you in. It's like fishing. He lures you in. He's got the bait. The bait looks good. Looks good. And then you go and you bite it, but then there's a hook. And the hook will hook you and take you where you never wanted to go. See, we talk about revival and we talk about great things, but the first thing that has to happen is we need to repent as a church. We need to turn as a people, and we need to set ourselves aside for God and say, not my will, God. But yours be done. And I believe as we rise up, and I honestly believe today can be a shift in our church and in your life if we rise up and we say, I'm not giving in to the enemy anymore. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to be, be all ma mad. And I'm not going to be offended. And I'm not going to be bitter. And I'm not going to keep looking at that thing on the internet. And I'm not going to sleep with that person anymore. And I'm not going to do this because I'm going to set myself up for God and I'm going to seek him, and I'm going to see my forest come to pass. The enemy's after your seed. So he can take your potential, and he can take this church's potential of what he wants us to do. Let's go to Ephesians 6. So I'm being a little hard today. I'm like a big papa rising up. I love you guys. Sometimes I have to be hard on you, don't I, Ty? A little bit. Don't mention it. I hope you hear the spirit, though, of how I'm saying this. I feel like I need to speak this out over our church and over your life so that we can do what God has called us to do. Do you realize Grant and I pray every week together? 
and we vision and dream together of what God can do, what he can do. See, do you know what a dream is? A dream is, is, is the vision of what the seed is going to look like one day. It's the vision of what the forest can look like one day. And we love what God is doing here. But we are never happy just to stay. We want to keep growing. We want to see revival. We want to see awakening. We want to see lives change in a massive way. You know what? I refuse to believe that God's best days are behind him. And that's how some of us act. I don't know if God wants to do revival today. I don't know if this is going to happen. I don't know if that. Well, you know what? I don't believe God's best days are behind him. Oh, one day in Acts, he did some great things. Oh, one day in Acts, he, two, 3,000 came to church one day. What came to Christ? Oh, back in Acts and back in that revival and back in the Great Awakening, God did great things, but he's just done today. Church, God's best days are ahead of him. I believe the greatest songs are yet to be written. The greatest buildings are yet to be built. The greatest books are yet to be written. I believe the greatest revivals are yet to come. And we have the opportunity to be a part of it if we would sow our seed, stay faithful, and see our forest come to pass. Amen? Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren. Somebody say brethren. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Let's just stop there a minute. That's good news. As we are wrestling the enemy, as we are coming against the enemy. God is not asking you to fight alone. God is not asking you to take on the enemy alone. Whatever is coming against you, it is not just up to you to overcome. But the Bible says... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Do you know what the Bible says in Isaiah 40, 31? But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary, and they shall walk and not grow faint. But when the enemy comes against you and he's, he's hitting you and it's hard, you begin to get weary, don't you? I do. I've been facing that. I've been facing battle after battle after battle. And even me, who's faithful and optimistic and barely ever sad, has felt under the weight. And I begin to feel under the weight. And, and I begin to feel like I can't move forward. And I begin to, what happens, the enemy comes against you and you start to lose hope. You start to lose vision. You start to get paralyzed so you can't move forward because you don't even believe God's going to do it anyway. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever kept stepping out and stepping out and trying and trying, and it's just things are just coming against you one after another? The Bible says those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. I love that. I need that. Carries on and says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, I believe what the enemy does. He comes and bombards us. And I was actually studying about the German Blitzkrieg and that they used to do. And in one of the things I read said this. It said, the Blitzkrieg in Germany is an anglicized word describing all Motorized force, concentration of tanks, infantry, artillery, combat engineers, and air power. Concentrating overwhelming force at high speed to break through the enemy lines. And once the lines are broken, proceeding without regard to its flank, through constant motion, the Blitzkrieg attempts to keep its enemy off balance, making it difficult to respond effectively at any given point before the front is moved on. And I believe that's what many of you are facing and us as a church are facing. The enemy is not just going to come and do one thing because you can recover quickly from that. He lets you go and lets you go. And all of a sudden, have you ever felt like that? Like one day, all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose? I believe that's what's happened over a lot of our lives. He comes in and he starts hitting us from the front and the side and the bottom and the top and from this family member and that church guy and this person and that guy and the guy who cut you off in the road. And he starts coming at you in every direction. Why? 
So you get confused and you don't even know how to respond and he can immobilize you from moving forward. He seeks to bring doubt, discouragement, despair, depression. He's taking us out. He's trying to take us out. He's seeking to take us out. But I love what this says. Therefore, someone say therefore. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. I want to come back to that. But let's read on. 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Listen to this in verse 16. Above all, someone say above all. Taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You want the answer? To put out the work of the enemy? It's faith. It's faith. It's faith. It's faith. It's always been faith. It's always been about faith in the kingdom of God. Always. The Bible says lift up your shield of faith. Hebrews says without faith. It is impossible to please God. Why? Because he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So let me connect connect this. When you are being attacked, when you are in the trenches, and you are weary, and you are broken, and you are wanting to retreat, and you are backing away, and the weight of the enemy's attacks are knocking you down. He seeks to take out your shield of faith, because without faith it's impossible to please God, and you start to doubt God's provision, doubt God's faithfulness, doubt God's love, doubt God's salvation, doubt God, and you start to get pulled under the weight. But you have to lift your shield of faith. Why? Because without faith it's impossible to please God, and he that comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those who seek him. He is what? He is. He's what? He is. Like with, with Moses, he said, I am. Or was that Abraham? <laughs> you know what I'm about. That guy. He said, I am. I am what? I am. Everything. I am the all-sufficient Savior. I am the, the God of the armies. I am faithful. I am the provider. I am the healer. I am the redeemer. I am the Lord who redeems and restores and revitalizes. I am love. I am peace. I am joy. I am salvation. I am freedom. That's the shield you need to lift. You need to lift it back up and say, I don't care what the enemy says. I know that my God is who he says he is, and he is a rewarder who seek him, and I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how deep this trench is. I don't care what fiery darts are coming against me. My God is faithful. I don't care if it looks like finances aren't coming through. They will, because he's a provider. I don't care if my body feels weak. He's a healer. I don't care if I feel depressed. He's my peace. I don't care if I feel weary. If I wait on the Lord, he'll renew my strength like the wings of eagles. I am who I say I am. So lift up your shield of faith, and I believe we need to do that as a church. See, the Bible says here in Ephesians, like I read, it says, Therefore take up the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. See, the Bible here, the pretext is that they're fighting. It's like a hand-to-hand combat with the enemy, and then fiery darts are coming. And I honestly, here's what I felt when I, I was preparing for this. I honestly felt like myself personally had to work through this. And I feel like you guys personally, but more so us as a family, I feel like we're getting beat down. I feel like the enemy's been doing his maneuvers and he's coming against us on every level. And I feel like where we're at is is we're like weakening. We're like we knew what God had for us, but it's like we're, we're backing. We're backing away And our shields are about to come down. But here's what I believe we need to do. Lift this shield. And in the spirit, in our spirit life, I'm talking. We're backing down in spirit. We're we're weary in spirit. We're weary in heart. 
And the Bible doesn't say jump up and run. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say sprint. The Bible doesn't say, do you know what the Bible says? When the evil day comes, stand firm. And I believe for many of us, that's what it is. In our spirit, we just need to stand. In our spirit, we need to stand up. We're, we're backing down, and we just need to go, you know what? No, you're not taking me out. And in your spirit, you just need to stand up. Say, whatever comes against me will not prosper. If God is for me, who can be against me? What weapon formed against me can prosper? What? Satan, you got nothing on me. God has already gotten the victory. I will not back down. I will not turn. I will not be depressed in spirit. But I will rise up and go toe-to-toe with the enemy. Bring it on. You will not take my seed. You will not take my destiny. You will not take our future. The victory is already won, and we are going to get up together. And do you know what's even more amazing? That shield of faith that the Bible is talking about, experts say, that it's not one of those little round shields. It's one of those big, huge Roman shields. And those shields were not meant to be used alone. They were meant to be used, joined side by side by side, so that when the flaming darts of the evil one came, they would not hit anyone on the team. And I believe in spirit. That's what we all need to do today. I don't care what bitterness you have. I don't care what confusion you have. I don't care what doubt you have. I don't care what the enemy's been doing in your life. He cannot touch you. If we join together as one family and we just do this together, We're going to do what God called us to do. It might hurt. It might be rough. It might be brutal. We might mess up and make mistakes, but we will be of those who cast into the deep to go rescue those God called us to rescue. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message from Risen Life. To find more, go to risenlife.net.